For me, it all started with a scream. This is the Game Trailer's Top 10 Scariest Games list. And this is the 1996 PlayStation game Clock Tower. Or Clock Tower 2 as it's known in Japan. Not to be confused with Clock Tower 2 The Struggle Within, which is called Clock Tower Ghost Head in Japan, but I digress. At the time of recording, I have not played Clock Tower, its prequel or its sequels. My only real connection to this game exists because of this game trailer's video, which I first saw at the time of its release back in 2006. Even symbols of protection and good, like the police, are twisted. Even symbols of protection and good, like the police, are twisted. GameTrailers.com aren't even around anymore. Resident Evil 4 has gotten old enough to receive the remake treatment, and I have hundreds of thousands of Swedish crowns in student debt. Yet this scream... <laughs> is still so vivid when I close my eyes and think about it. The whole scene is. I'd even go so far as to say that I remember it better than the entirety of some horror games. The question is... Why? Why did such a specific moment, not even 10 seconds long, make a permanent residence in my mind? I didn't fully understand it back then, but I think I do now. And my answer is fairly simple. Older looking horror games are just scarier. With a little help from people who have developed such games, I will attempt to explain why this is, as well as take the opportunity to celebrate what makes these games great. What's wrong? Help! Someone is following me! Hmm, some kind of weirdo? I'm mainly going to use the label of low poly horror when discussing the games in this video, in reference to the lower amount of polygons used to create their 3D graphics. Some of these games went for a PlayStation 1 or 2 aesthetic, others went for more of a late 90s PC look, although I will only discuss such distinctions when deemed necessary. I also want to clarify that I'm by no means saying that big budget AAA games with more up-to-date graphics can't be scary. Some of my best friends are big budget AAA games. What I am saying is that they generally don't attract me as much. If you happen to disagree that older looking horror games are scarier, which you have every right to do, my hope is that you will at least learn to appreciate the graphical and narrative strengths which, turns out, are almost exclusive to the contemporary low poly horror subgenre. Let's start by looking at the most obvious of these strengths, which is how the games look and sound. Back when PlayStation consoles still had the best startup music of all time, it was quite difficult to make 3D character models convincingly human-like. Maybe if you see a silhouette of good old Resident Evil protagonist Chris Redfield, or if you squint really hard, he will look relatively close to something with an actual pulse. But it doesn't take much to break the illusion. Not to sound like the inner voice giving me the occasional gender dysphoria, but Chris's bodily proportions are clearly a bit off. His torso is literally a rectangle, his fingers seem to have been dipped in super glue, and his eyes, ears and mouth are just textures. Like stickers stuck to a mannequin. Chris Redfield is not standing at the bottom of the uncanny valley, but he definitely decided to settle down somewhere near the top of the cliff face. Instinctively, you'd probably say that this is a bad thing. It's the zombie's job to be off-putting, not the human player characters. However, I'd argue that Chris's unsettling features, or lack thereof, fit right into a game world which already attempts to use all other aspects of its design to fill you with a sense of dread. You can easily distance yourself from what's happening on screen since it doesn't look real. But that's simultaneously the reason why it's slightly more uncanny than in any of the more recent Resident Evil games. These zombies look like something that could potentially exist in real life. They look like people and they move like people. The zombies in the first couple of games, as well as the human characters, shouldn't be able to exist at all. Yet they do. Like abstract nightmares come to life through the power of technology. The limitations of the PlayStation's hardware worked to the game's benefit 
rather than to its detriment. The same can be said of the game that was directly influenced by the success of Resident Evil, Silent Hill, which disguised the PlayStation's inability to render the titular town in its entirety by enveloping the player character in thick clouds of fog, further enhancing its isolating atmosphere. And yes, it can also be said of the poor sound quality in Clock Tower, which turns what would have been a regular human scream in that one death scene into something as scary as the kill itself. Also, similar to Chris Redfield, the character model of Helen is more reminiscent of some creepy doll you'd likely find at your old grandmother's house than a person. The way she slowly slides down to the restroom floor, her back against the wall, as she realizes that she's about to get skewered, is as heartbreaking as it is disturbing. This brutal moment is not what you'd expect or want to see happen to a children's toy. It adds an additional layer of rawness to it that you just won't get from a modern AAA game, which prioritizes being cutting edge over cutting corners. Well, they sure don't mind cutting some corners. One of the horror game developers I reached out to during the making of this video, Kitty Horror Show, also shared this insightful observation about the PlayStation 1 era of horror games. There was no set standard, so many games became these sort of visual Frankenstein monsters. And that's very compelling from a horror standpoint, because of that psychological predisposition towards being unsettled by things that look janky or wrong. The feeling that reality or the world around you isn't functioning the way it should be, or that something is off. There's something that's very particular to the PS1, and I think it's why a lot of people go for that aesthetic, and that's the vertex snapping effect. It's what makes 3D objects and environments in PS1 games look like they're shivering, because all the vertices of their models are kind of jittering back and forth, snapping to the nearest point in space rounded up to a certain amount. It's a really distinct look that everyone who played PS1 instantly recognizes as deeply unsettling in the context of horror games. Everything looks like it's sick or volatile, like things are crawling underneath the surface and the skin of the world is cringing and shuddering around you. Other PS1 graphics limitations contribute to this too. Limited color depth gives textures a kind of grungy, rusty look, for example, but the vertex snapping is the really big one. To illustrate the effectiveness of the low poly horror aesthetic versus a more modern look, there is luckily a perfect example. The From Software game Bloodborne, released in 2015 for the PlayStation 4, received a PlayStation 1 style demake in 2022, primarily developed by Lilith Walter. The Lovecraftian influences of the original game, the huge indescribable monsters, the haunting soundtrack, and the focus on darker environments, blood and madness, conveys a desire to frighten the player even more than the developer's previous outings. It certainly succeeds. However, Bloodborne PSX shows us how much scarier the original game could have been by utilizing all of the previously mentioned limitations of the PlayStation 1, and then some. The streets and underground passages of Yarnum, previously wide and clearly illuminated by lanterns, torches, and moonlight, now feel tighter due to being shrouded in a pitch black darkness that constantly obscures the player's view, like the fog of Silent Hill. The lower frame rate makes movement unnervingly choppy and unpredictable. The vertex snapping gives the previously mentioned feeling of things crawling underneath the surface of the world, and the screen, and the sound design. Oh, that sweet sound design. It sings to me. Literally. One of the best parts of Bloodborne PSX, in my opinion, is the changes made to the enemy type Winter Lanterns. These wandering, tumorous creatures possess the power to induce madness within the player character, which translates to the majority of your health bar being instantly depleted. The only way of avoiding this fate is by not allowing them to see or get near you. In the original Bloodborne, they can actually be quite easy to deal with. You just try to sneak or run past them as soon as you hear the humming of their familiar tune. When spotted by a Winter Lantern in Bloodborne PSX, on the other hand, it will hunt you Nemesis style. It will even follow you in between loading screens. Not only are they way creepier due to the lower amount of polygons making them look even more alien than before, their signature singing is creepier as well.
It's undoubtedly the same audio file that was used in the original Bloodborne, but the audio quality is significantly downgraded. Crunchier. It's the difference between listening to a song on Spotify and listening to the same song on an old vinyl record that miraculously survived a house fire. You can hear that it's the same song, but one definitely brings you more discomfort than the other. I think that perfectly describes not just the difference between Bloodborne and Bloodborne PSX, but the difference between high and low poly horror games as a whole. Horror games can absolutely benefit from being remade. For example, if the intention is to include more detailed and real looking body horror. However, remaking a game also tends to include polishing it, both graphically and gameplay wise. And polish isn't exactly high on the list of things that make something scary. The reason why there has been a low poly horror revival in recent years, in the form of developers like Puppet Combo and the yearly release of the haunted PS1 demo disc, I think, is the same reason why developers are still making 8 and 16 bit platformers. The strengths within those limitations simply work a little better with certain genres. We've all seen PS1 Hagrid, from the 2001 classic based on the work of a notorious turf, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Well, somebody made a whole horror game about this character, Hagrid, not the turf, where he stalks you, rather than forcing you to play terrible on-rail minigames. Frankly, I don't know what's worse. It's obviously intended as a joke, but it sure says something about how easy it can be to turn something with a low poly aesthetic into effective horror. All you really need to do is dim the lights and add some distressing ambience. The rest was kind of scary to begin with. I'm going to pause for a bit to say that this video would literally not exist if I had not reached my monthly donation goal on Patreon. And I want to take the opportunity to thank every single one of my patrons who made this happen. I'm not able to work on this channel full time. Not yet. Not by a long shot. But your continued support makes it worth all the effort I put into it. If you want to become a patron and help this channel stay afloat, please consider checking out the link in the video description. You'll get your name in the end credits of all future videos, early access to videos, as well as podcasts, vlogs, and behind the scenes stuff. You also get an invite to the Discord server, where we do monthly movie nights, among other things. Well, here's to the next Patreon goal, I guess. Which is... You know what? It's actually okay if you don't want to donate. So far, I've only talked about the superficial stuff, which makes sense considering that this video is mainly about aesthetics. But there is more to it than that. Not only does developing a game with lower graphical fidelity make almost every step of development easier and quicker, on the indie scene, where the low poly horror subgenre is currently flourishing, it also allows for more experimentation with old and new approaches to game making. When I asked Lilith Walter what she finds compelling about the low poly aesthetic, she responded, I feel like going to old PS1 style game design has its merits. People tend to think of old game design as bad, but there's a lot of things that designers gave up on for the sake of quality of life. My go-to example for this is the key system in old games, which I brought back for Bloodborne PSX. Instead of a key being sent to your inventory so quickly that you forget you even got it, only to discover that you can open a door three hours later while randomly exploring, having to manage your keys by equipping and unequipping them in the menu makes them stick out in your brain. On top of this, locked doors plainly stating which key is needed means that picking up a recognized key in Bloodborne PSX can sometimes fill you with excitement. This part of her response reminds me a whole lot of an interview with another indie developer. Salavir Nelson Jr., who made this comparison during an episode of the Glasshouse Games podcast. And the evil within, too, just because of what we're used to in the third person genre, it doesn't make sense to not have the player be unable to crouch. If we just turn off crouching, people will be like, well, I wanted to duck under that attack. Or like, why can't my photorealistic, uh, handsome, divorced cop man, does he have, like, what's his <laughs> number? Why can't he move realistically? And when you are dealing with something in the PS1 and even the PS2 era, you suddenly, with the human, again, just still talking about the weird things that the human brain and the imagination allows for, yeah. you see a character and it can't crouch, and you deal with the 
um, terror of having an inability, uh, a, a, a something constraining you from the outside looking at it. And it's much like watching a horror movie in that regard and being like, don't go in that closet. And for God's sake, don't say anything while you're in that closet. And they do it anyway. Here is Harry Mason walking, or he, what he calls running, like two feet a second through blinding fog. And you're like, Harry, please turn, please, please turn. <laughs> and he won't turn. And y your brain accepts that and can then go along with the new reality and explore why and how this is terrifying and what the hell am I gonna do next? What both of these quotes have in common, I think, is that they shed a light on how older and older looking horror games condition the player to abandon ideas of both player convenience and realism. To paraphrase Getting Over It developer Bennett Foddy, we often tend to view video games more as software than a creative art in terms of how they should function. Their design should be intuitive, familiar, adaptable. Anything and everything that potentially stands in the way of a player using or even understanding how a game works is usually viewed as bad in video game design. Personally, I think all video games should at least contain options to make them accessible to most people, whether the options are in the game's menus or baked into the gameplay itself. Although, I also believe that this is where the core strength of low-poly horror lies. What we take for granted in modern games is restricted, both in terms of visuals and gameplay. The field of view, movements and actions, the amount of places you can manually save your progress, all limited. A game where you have to pick out keys manually, like in Bloodborne PSX, can make you more mindful of the keys you have and where to use them. More importantly though, it can also create additional tension. Say you're playing a game where you're being hunted by a particularly tough monster. Would it be scarier if you immediately and automatically opened the door to safety, or if you had to go through each and every key in your possession until you find the right one? Add some clunky tank controls to that situation, and you got yourself a nice little panic soup. Just like mom used to make them. Mwah. The low poly horror revival is doing even more than what was possible back in the 90s and early 2000s though. Back then, low poly games were the AAA games. Several hours long, lots of replay value, never so experimental as to completely alienate the audience. They were high budget commercial products. As low poly horror gradually became retro, that started to change. Today, you can make and buy highly experimental games that are less than an hour long on platforms that allow you to pick your own price at checkout. Ironically, what used to be an aesthetic burst out of hardware limitations has now become somewhat synonymous with artistic freedom. I'll explain with another comparison. The first Evil Within game is set inside of a Matrix-style digital mindscape, where the memories and thoughts of the main antagonist Ruvik make up the game's levels. A spooky village, a spooky mansion, a spooky city, the classic stuff you'd expect from the director of Resident Evil 1 and 4. For a significant chunk of the game, you have no idea that you're strolling and sneaking around inside someone else's brain. All that you know is that you're somewhat confusingly hopping between a bunch of environments with little to no connective tissue. It's supposed to simulate the feeling of going deeper and deeper into an unpredictable dream. But the game doesn't look like one. What it does look like is a polished AAA horror game. Even with all its monsters and occasionally mind-bending visual effects, the game is just too grounded in logical locations and homogenized gameplay conventions to be convincingly nightmarish. Compare this to a low-poly horror game like Paratopic by Arbitrary Metric. At merely 40 minutes in length, in terms of creating a surrealistic and dreamlike atmosphere, this game accomplishes what The Evil Within spends up to 15 to 30 hours trying to accomplish. The juxtaposition of real faces on vertex snapping, simplistic character models, the sudden hard cuts between scenes, the long meditative drives along empty highways, the absurd store clerk who talks to you about a giant ball of twine and a store that exclusively sells milk products. This looks and feels like a proper fever dream. It's implied that you're playing as more than one character, but who you are at any given moment is deliberately left ambiguous. 
As you're driving on the highway with your mysterious box of VHS tapes in the passenger seat, the box will occasionally be replaced with a revolver. Then nothing. Then the box again. So who is driving? Is it the character who was tasked with smuggling the tapes? Or the one who shot the unarmed man at the diner? Are they the same person? Like in an actual dream or nightmare, these questions are never properly answered. It simply ends with you spending between a couple of minutes to a whole day trying to figure out just what the hell your brain put you through. The Space Between by Christoph Frey plays around with similar ideas by conveying its story primarily through subtitles, with no distinctive voices or features clarifying who is saying what. Obviously, this is a narrative tool that could be used in any video game, regardless of the polygon count. But similarly to the Banjo-Kazooie meets Ambient-style voices of Paratopic, it works so well in this case because its potency is enhanced by the game's aesthetic. Both of these games are to some degree about disconnection. Paratopic disconnects you from who you are, and the space between disconnects you from the people around you. By relying on the low-poly horror aesthetic, both also disconnect you from their respective worlds making them and their inhabitants feel more unwelcoming. It's arguably what makes them horror games at all. The story of the space between isn't even a horror story, not explicitly. Rather, it's about intimacy. What it really means to be close to someone, if it's even possible to know someone completely, and the fear of getting too close. From an outsider's perspective, these concepts don't look scary, but they can feel terrifying. And with the low-poly horror aesthetic, I'd argue that Christoph Frey manages to visually communicate how terrifying it can be. Contrary to The Evil Within, these games deny the player easily readable and literal interpretations. They don't just tell you that you're in an alternate reality and expect you to go along with it. They embed the surrealism into every facet of their design. Their narratives, their gameplay, and yes, their aesthetics. One thing that has bothered me for some time is how when horror games break the fourth wall, or more specifically attempt to trick you into believing that something is literally wrong with the game, it rarely ever feels like a genuine threat to the player. Chris Franklin of the YouTube channel Errant Signal points to the glitchiness in Oxenfree as simply being an incidental framing device for the game's visual spooks. While Oxenfree is a 2D indie game, showing that this isn't a trope exclusive to the AAA side of the industry, I believe its use of these glitchy effects is a good representation of the larger issue. Even in Eternal Darkness, the AAA game that arguably does this the best, the novelty of the now infamous delete save fakeout, and the random instances of the player character clipping through the environment as the result of a depleting sanity meter, is somewhat lost due to how quickly the game decides to bring out Ashton Kutcher. Who got you? Who got you? What happened? What happened? Did you get punched? You got me. Damn! <laughs> Write a comment about not getting this joke if you want me to feel old. It's also worth noting that Eternal Darkness came out in 2002. The fact that no AAA horror game has surpassed it in terms of meta scares is yet another example of how creatively restrictive this side of the industry can be. Enter the House of Anatomy, built by Kitty Horror Show, a place of metaphorical and literal decay. I could make a whole video about this game alone. It's genuinely one of the best horror games I've played in my entire life. Although for now, I will try to avoid talking too much about why it works and focus more on how it gradually breaks. Anatomy will purposefully crash and send you back to your desktop more than once. And each time you boot the game up again, the house will only be more twisted until it can barely be considered to be a house at all. At least not one you could ever call home. Objects start blinking in and out of existence. Furniture appears in impossible positions, even blending together. Thick black lines cover multiple rooms like veins. And the voice recordings used to progress the story become distorted to the point that all you can hear is unintelligible noises. It's as if the game itself is actively fighting to hold itself together. Because if it can't, it will be forced to loosen its grip on you. Horror Show usually aims for a late 90s, early 2000s PC aesthetic in her games. However, Anatomy also takes advantage of the visual quality found on VHS tapes, scan lines and all. 
Horror Show isn't the only one who's mixed these visual styles in the low-poly horror genre either. You can also find it in Puppet Combo's various productions, which leans way more to the side of B-movie slashers and 80s pastiche than psychological horror. Yet, these aesthetics actually do wonders for both subgenres of low-poly horror games. How come? A quote I received from developer Tomas Esconjauregai comes to mind. I think that's because the VHS and the PS1 shared some space and time which evokes a bit of nostalgia in players. Also from an aesthetic perspective, the VHS's post-processing helps to blend the low-poly aesthetic and make it look a bit more natural. I believe the low-poly aesthetic leaves room for players' imagination. It's like looking at scary photos of ghosts or whatever on the internet. The most interesting ones usually have very low resolution. The VHS look implies years of aging and neglect. It's a reminder of a forgotten era, one you might have experienced personally but that no longer serves a meaningful purpose in your everyday life. This aesthetic blends seamlessly with the low-poly models and architecture as well as the narrative of anatomy. At some point, the residents of this house left, reasons unknown, and it has desperately tried to cope with all its years and decades of abandonment since creating ghosts to walk its halls just to feel a sense of company. In this regard, Anatomy is sort of emblematic of the low-poly horror revival. It refuses to be forgotten. The video game industry certainly tried to forget it, but it only came back stronger, angrier, louder, and more unstable. Which finally leads us to The Night of the Scissors by the aforementioned Tomas Esconjauregai, another horror game that utilizes the strengths of both the low-poly horror and VHS aesthetic. I bought it in part because I really liked the box art, and in part because, hey, it's a horror game with scissors in it. Like Clock Tower, I figured it would be somewhat similar to that game, but what I didn't realize was how similar it would be to me, personally. It's a very short and simple game, the vibe is reminiscent of some obscure tape you'd find in an old video rental shop, a horror film lost in the sea of derivatives. You tank control a burglar named Adam through an abandoned post office, when the night suddenly takes a dramatic turn as he's confronted by the presence of a scissor-wielding serial killer known as the Snipper. An absolutely adorable name for someone who'll kill you in such a gruesome way, should he get the chance. The Night of the Scissors is memorable for a multitude of reasons. How the sound of the scissors is used to warn you of the distance between you and your murderous stalker is, by itself, a neat demonstration of how emotionally effective this everyday appliance can be at inducing terror. At one point during my playthrough, I entered a warehouse portion of the building, where I found a large hole in the floor. As I investigated it, I could hear the faint sound of the snipper moving closer. Since I didn't yet have the rope required to descend into the hole in front of me, I chose to turn off my flashlight and move my back against a nearby wall, hoping I would blend into the darkness. What happened next? Well, see for yourself. Oh, and if you're squeamish about blood and gore, this is the time to look away. <laughs> Without thinking about it, I had recreated the death scene from the PlayStation 1 Clock Tower game that I saw in the game trailers video 16 years ago. And just like that scene, this one quickly burrowed itself into my brain and has not let go since. Tomas told me he's never even played Clock Tower, that any connections to it are entirely coincidental. And yet, The Knight of the Scissors uses the same low poly aesthetic takes advantage of the same graphical limitations with almost the exact same result. Decades apart from each other. This gives me such confidence that even when the glory days of the survival horror classics are long gone, this aesthetic will live on. Whether games are molded out of dream logic or an appreciation of unhinged graphical violence, old or new design philosophies, the low-poly horror aesthetic has proven itself to be as effective and scary as it was all the way back in the 1990s, if not more so. As AAA high-poly horror games get visually more impressive every year, losing some of that well-needed dust and grime in the process, you can always count on people like Kitty Horror Show or Puppet Combo to have you covered. That is if you dare to look back. 
I'm not gonna lie though, some of these older horror games are actually hilarious, and I don't think it was entirely intentional. Some kind of weirdo. Thank you so much for watching. Since it makes things way easier for me to organize, I will now start reading the names of those who donate $5 or more on Patreon in alphabetical order. So a special thanks to Anade, Eben Phantom, Eliza Tantivy, Elizabeth Haste, Hovard Krugerud, Infernal Ramblings, Jack Lightfoot, Jesse Earl, Kiki Dharma, Lesser Sage of Stars, Hey, you're my first $10 patron, thank you so much for that. Mackenzie Pollock. Mechathug. Metal Gear Fox. Nichtschwert. Nick Owens. Professor Flowers. Sethsard. Silk Moth. Tobias Matson. Unregistered Hypercadence. And Vinders. I also want to thank Codex Entry. Ragnaroks and Solmatol for lending their voices, David J. Bradley, Eurothug4000, and I am Error for proofreading the script, and a huge thanks to all the game devs who helped me out with this video. You'll find all of their personal links in the video description, where you'll also find some itch.io links to some of the games I've talked about. And finally, I want to give you all a short sneak peek at what's to come.